very much for being here today. Uh, very excited to have you join us for this special event. My name is Andy DeSoto. I'm the Director of Government Relations at the Association for Psychological Science. If you aren't familiar with APS, we are an international organization of over 30,000 individuals dedicated to advancing psychology across disciplinary and geographic borders. I'm really pleased to announce today's webinar, which is titled Clinical Psychological Science Through the Lens of RDoc, New Advances in Future Directions. Before we begin, just some quick logistical reminders and details. So today's event will be 90 minutes long, uh, which is a slight change from the initially advertised time, 90 minutes. Um, as participants, your uh, attendees, your cameras and microphones will be off. Uh, if you'd like to ask questions uh, of our panelists today, please use the question and answer feature, which is at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, our, our time for questions and discussion will be at the end of today's session. Now let's get on to the topic. As part of the mission of APS's government research funding and policy initiatives, we are very interested in sharing the latest and greatest psychological science, as well as the government science agencies that uh, support and conduct that work. Today's webinar is focused on innovative research in clinical psychological science, and we're really excited to have brought together scientists doing cutting edge research in this discipline with representatives from the National Institute of Mental Health, which is the US's lead federal agency for research on mental disorders. Here's what you can expect today. First, you'll hear an introduction to NIMH's Research Domain Criteria, or RDOC, which is a research framework for new approaches to investigating mental disorders, from Sarah Morris, who is Associate Head of NIMH's RDOC unit and the Branch Chief in NIMH's Adult Psychopathology and Psychosocial Interventions Research Branch. Next, you'll hear three research talks from psychological scientists Vijay Middle, Adam Kujawa, and Anne-Marie McNamara. Our discussant for today's program is Uma Vaidyanathan, who is research and innovation manner, excuse me, research and innovation manager in the NIMH's director's office. As we have a full program to enjoy in the next hour and a half, let me pass things uh, right over to Sarah Morris, who will say a few words of introduction to our doc. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Andy. And thank you, uh, and to, thanks to APS for hosting this uh, webinar. We're really happy to be here today. Okay, so um, for I'm just going to give a very brief overview about RDoc today. Um, talk a little bit about the rationale for RDoc um, and uh, an overview of the RDoc structure um, and our principles related to RDoc research. And then I'll hand it over to the main event, which is um, the research talks from three outstanding investigators. So um, the first phase of the rationale of RDoc is really um, dissatisfaction um, among patients and family members um, with existing uh, diagnostic structures. Um, anybody who has used the DSM or the ICD knows that um, patients may receive multiple diagnoses um, and that although the DSM has allowed um, a, a decent level of reliability. It's not, it's not as good as it could possibly be. Oftentimes providers can't agree and uh, patients end up going through a very frustrating and sometimes prolonged period of diagnosis, misdiagnosis, rediagnosis. Um, and those diagnoses provide only modest information about clinical prognosis. Treatment remains a trial and error. Um, endeavor um, with many people needing multiple different treatment approaches before um, having uh, reaching an efficacious response. Distress is a major symptom and criteria for the DSM, but it varies from day to day and hour to hour. And then um, our current diagnostic um, frameworks don't give good information about when should treatment end. Um, and that's a difficult decision for clinicians. And then from the scientific point of view, uh, for researchers, um, our current systems remain based on clinical symptoms and signs, um, which are difficult to measure um, objectively and re reliably. Um, although the systems are devised for reliability, um, they are arguably lacking in validity. Um, although 
the DSM presents diagnoses as if they are valid scientific entities, the data increasingly shows that um, perhaps they are lacking in, in validity uh, as measured in different ways. DSM disorders are broad syndromes. They are heterogeneous. There are high levels of comorbidity and high reliance on not otherwise specified diagnoses. Disorders are, as we know, um, disorders occurring naturally are dimensional, that there's not a bright line between healthy and sick um, as is suggested by DSM categories. And so scientifically, it's important to look at that spectrum uh, of health to illness and not prematurely draw bright lines and boundaries um, between health and illness or between disorders. And all of these um, weaknesses in the current diagnostic approach have contributed to the failure to establish biomarkers because it's very difficult to find a, a biomarker of an illness that is so heterogeneous and overlapping with other disorders. So we were faced with a problem 10 years ago before RDOC was launched, we were faced with a problem that these diagnostic categories, which have allowed the evolution of the science of psychiatry and are essential to clinical practice. However, they were driving the entire research and clinical systems. Grant reviews, journal publications, clinical trials, regulatory approvals are all based on um, DSM diagnosis. And so the NIMH wanted to take a step back and move away from this sort of unwritten rule that um, NIMH funded research should only be guided by what's in the DSM. So the maybe bumper sticker version of what is RDOC is that the National Institute of Mental Health is not the National Institute of the DSM. And researchers should be free to explore new ways of classifying disorders in the hopes of achieving more precision in diagnosis and treatment. And so at that time, again, we sort of took a step back. What do we know about mental disorders? We know more than ever about behavioral neuroscience. Um, we know that psychopathology um, occurs along neurodevelopmental trajectories. We know that there are bi-directional interactions with environment in both risk and protective ways. Um, we know that psychopathology is dimensional and that we know that we're best off if we measure and relate many aspects together, the psychological, the biological, self-report behavior, instead of focusing on any one of those measures as um, the gold standard or the foundational. And so with the long-term goal of moving away from one size fits all diagnoses toward, di toward dimensional transdiagnostic mechanisms, we implemented these strategic principles trying to invert the clinical paradigm instead of starting with a mental disorder as defined by criteria and trying to understand the mechanism of that disorder, starting with what we know about normal, healthy, adaptive mechanisms and figure out where things go wrong to result in pathology. Again, focusing on that normal to abnormal dimension, studying transitions to psychopathology uh, developmentally so to inform early intervention, using data-driven constructs jointly defined by behavior and cognition as implemented by neural circuits, and more recently adopting computational neuroscience approaches to um, understand those relationships that are complex and not apparent to the naked eye, but um, can be, that can be derived using computational approaches. The RDOC framework itself is embedded in a lifespan developmental trajectory, acknowledging various impacts of various environmental factors along the lifespan, and thinking in terms of dimensional constructs that can be measured using multiple units of analysis uh, again, with the interest on capturing that whole span of, of the dimension of a construct and then looking at the extremes and figuring out how the psychopathology arises.
We've had this series of funding announcements related to RDOC starting in 2012. Um, these have resulted in um, of over 95 grants um, funded under these specific announcements, but then of course many other grants that are funded um, that are related to RDOC but are funded under other funding announcements that aren't specific to RDOC. So it's a little difficult to quantify the RDOC portfolio at this point um, because a, any given research project can implement certain um, principles of RDOC. So there, again, it's, it's dimensional in and of itself. There's no bright line between what makes an RDOC project and what doesn't. Um, but these 95 grants are, are good uh, sort of gold standard exemplars of RDOC. Another example, we were really gratified to see this big project um, funded by NIMH called the Aurora Project, advancing understanding of recovery under trauma, informed by the idea that um, the pathological response to trauma can take many shapes and forms, um, and that it's important, again, to understand that heterogeneity across different types of trauma and different um, profiles of outcomes. Another example, um, an international example, psych psychiatric ratings using intermediate stratified markers. Uh, this is an, in an innovative medicines initiative funded multi-site study of social withdrawal transdiagnostically across schizophrenia, Alzheimer's disease, and major depression. Again, to look for transdiagnostic um, uh, mechanisms related in this example to social withdrawal. And finally, just to talk a little bit about clinical trials, of course, um, you know, ultimately with our doc, our goal is to improve diagnosis and classification uh, and lead, leading to better, more precise therapeutics and novel treatment targets. So we agree with this paper uh, where they said, we see little alternative to the pursuit of transdiagnostic functional domains as the core targeted features of neuropsychiatric disorders. So I will stop there and uh, thank you all for attending and I am happy to uh, hand it over to Dr. Vijay Mittal. VJ, you might be no, uh, muted just in case you're not aware. Sorry for the delay there. Um, I want to thank everyone for this opportunity. I'm very excited and, and uh, honored to be part of this panel uh, and uh, really excited about where RDOC is going too. Um, and before I uh, begin today, I just want to thank my lab and my family and, and uh, the, the funding agencies, particularly NIH. Um, you know, it's, it's been incredibly helpful to have their support during all of this work. Um, so before I start uh, talking a little bit about uh, a big aspect of my research program, I want to frame the clinical population in question. Uh, the, wor the work I do focuses on the psychosis prodrome. And this includes young adults and adolescents that are showing signs that they're at risk for developing a psychotic disorder like schizophrenia. Um, the uh, signs can vary, but they look a lot like delusions and hallucinations, uh, negative symptoms, things like affecting affect, cognitive decline, social withdrawal. We use clinical interviews and uh, we have some uh, really strong um, criteria that, that the field has decided on and that allows us to collaborate in a reliable and valid way. But when, when I'm giving talks I, uh, for people outside of, uh, of those that use that interview, I like to use these Lewis Wayne uh, cat paintings uh, to, to kind of make the point. Lewis Wayne was a prolific uh, commercial artist in, in England and he developed schizophrenia. 
and he continued to draw. And you can see here cats that he drew uh, during uh, his course of illness. And uh, the prodrome, uh, be beginning to, to look at people at risk, would really represent this first line of cats, uh, where there's something off, something odd that's going on that you can't put your finger on. So the teenagers that come into our lab are starting to maybe uh, think their parents called their name, uh, but then no one was home, or they think they saw something out of the corner of their eye. And we are interested in following people that have these experiences recently start, uh, or if they're more longstanding, have them get worse recently in the, la in the last couple of months. And, and um, it, it, as we follow them over time, uh, the uh, criteria along dimensions of distress, frequency, severity, insight, conviction, um, they all increase. So somebody might start to um, put together that, uh, you know, they're thinking that someone is home and they sense a presence and they might link that to another symptom and it might make them miss school the next day. And it, it escalates up this ladder, just, just like Lewis Wayne escalated and his perceptions of uh, normality changed to the point where uh, we would consider that psychotic. Um, and so when we use this paradigm, uh, which was really uh, invented and, and, and refined in the early 2000s, uh, we're able to um, follow uh, teenagers and, and young adults, and in about a year, 15% of them will go on to develop a psychotic disorder like schizophrenia, and in about two years, uh, roughly a third of them. Uh, since the, this, this work came out, uh, the numbers have declined slightly, and we believe that's in large part due to the uh, efficacy of some of the early intervention efforts. The great hope of this work is that we'll be able to stop psychotic disorders from happening. Um, and there's lots of promising treatment work here. Uh, there's lots of benefits in finding people before they develop psychosis. Uh, I've listed a few here, but um, there, there are many, many more. Uh, and in addition, having these longitudinal uh, studies where we can prospectively follow people in a period before many of the third variable confounds associated with schizophrenia research are there, um, you know, like years of antipsychotic use and substance abuse and, and things like that, uh, allows us a clear mechanistic understanding. And so there's been some major breakthroughs in the field of psychosis because of this work. But there, there's still some questions and challenges. Um, you know, we are not great at finding people who meet criteria for this. Uh, we use a lot of resources for that. Uh, so for the general population, our, we need a lot more work on screening uh, and, and screening out noise uh, and other disorders. And uh, in addition to that, um, once we find people, only a third of them at, at best will develop the disorder. Um, and so we can't just use blanket treatments. These treatments are expensive and, and they have side effects and sometimes, and, and, and there's, a lot of, there's a lot of other reasons. So, being able to find who might develop the disorder among phenotypically similar youth uh, is also a major priority. And then the, la the last major priority is understanding what is driving this illness. We still don't have a great handle on what causes schizophrenia and, and, and psychotic disorders more broadly. And until we do, we're really not gonna be able to develop the kinds of treatments that these patients and individuals deserve. So my solution to um, addressing these questions and challenges has been to look at motor behavior. And that might sound uh, like a fair, fairly arbitrary or, or, ra or random decision, but I assure you it is not. Uh, it turns out that several of the circuits that uh, govern motor behavior are also highly implicated in the pathogenesis of psychotic disorders. And in fact, when you follow uh, motor development and look at abnormalities uh, in people that develop psychotic disorders, it follows what would be predicted by a typical diathesis stress model. Um, so we know um, on the far end that when people develop schizophrenia, independent of medication, uh, they show a variety of abnormal movements. Uh, we're going to talk about several of them today. Uh, we also know that children, uh, infants, in fact, that uh, you know one day will develop schizophrenia later on in adulthood, show motor delays as well as characteristic abnormalities. Some of the work from my doctoral mentor, Elaine Walker, has, has been um, a landmark in this area. And I'm gonna show you some examples here of, of what I mean. So this is a little blurry, forgive me, um, but you can see here uh, that there is a withered hand. I'm just gonna pause it there. Oh, when I pause it, it goes away. All right, let me 
so this is a type of uh, dystonia, anathetosis, where there's a muscle spasm, uh, where an agonist and antagonist muscle twist. And that, that's something we see a lot in adults. This child is using a highly asymmetrical crawling pattern. So there's issues with motor laterality here. Uh, this child only uses one hand to manipulate the object. Um, there's poor uh, fine motor skill development here uh, at a year. They're, they're not able to um, manipulate the package. They're using a pincer movement. And here at eight months, uh, the child is not able to write themselves. And that speaks to a paucity of movement. So Elaine's research uh, compared videos of people, the childhood movies um, with schizophrenia. They had brought them in and compared them to community controls and found motor delays, uh, delays in milestones and these kinds of abnormalities. What was so interesting with this research was that by the time that these youth were later in childhood, uh, right before adolescence, it was these kinds of signs were no longer visible. Um, and that's not because they went away, it's because um, people eventually do meet milestones. And so that is no longer a useful index. Uh, so we know the vulnerability is there because it's there once people are psychotic and it's there from birth, uh, but we can no longer see it very easily. With, with the observational methods um, that, that we, we used in the, in the Walker videos. And so um, my idea uh, was that perhaps in these teens and young adults that are starting to have emerging psychosis, we might be able to see who is gonna develop the disorder uh, early uh, by seeing if these signs kind of start to re-emerge or become more obvious, like we see them in psychotic disorders like schizophrenia. So um, I got very excited about doing this work and was all ready to launch my career in 2010 when I first became an assistant professor and RDoc came out and um, they didn't have a motor, a, a motor domain. <laughs> and at, at, at the first uh, pass, it also didn't look like they weren't taking development very seriously either. And, you know, so, so that was disappointing for me. I was very excited about RDoc. Uh, but I have to say, and, and I'm not just saying this because all of the RDoc people are here, <laughs> uh, that, that they're incredibly responsive. Um, my, my team and several others, you know, wrote a lot about these issues and the RDoc team wrote back and, and uh, you know, there, there were workshops and development, a uh, uh, lot, lot of development. You know, th this whole RDoc thing is labor of love and there are a lot of smart people nurturing it. And, and I'm really excited to say, uh, you know, they're, they became a motor domain <laughs> and, and it's, it's, it's perfectly lovely. I'll show you lots of examples in a few minutes. Um, and uh, there was just recently an environmental workshop uh, where, and a developmental workshop where, where we worked to um, build uh, models that would better highlight development. Um, so uh, another really good thing uh, about motor behavior, particularly, uh, is that it's very circuit centric. Un understanding circuits and schizophrenia and motor and schizophrenia overlap quite well. Um, so, for example, uh, basal ganglia circuit abnormalities uh, will result in um, that athetosis I showed you, uh, but also some slowing. So you see some rigidity and tremor here, some ballistic uh, head neck trunk movement here. Uh, cerebellar circuit abnormality, which is also highly implicated in psychosis, will result in clumsiness, uh, as well as a variety of sensory motor integration abnormalities, deficits in motor learning, and some other things we're going to talk about in a few minutes. And then uh, there are these cortico-cortical motor circuits uh, that are involved in more complex higher order movements, like gestures that are linked together with cognitive and language processes. And all of these are impacted in psychosis. And, and, and so uh, it's exciting because we can look at specific motor behavior and get an idea of what's going on in the brain and understand potential uh, pathophysiology and, and, and also uh, look at clinical targets uh, as well. Um, so another part of RDoc that I, I mentioned that I'm excited about is how well it adapts to development. And I'll use more motor examples here. Um, so I mentioned when I, when I was showing you Elaine Walker's videos that uh, you know, when the children get a little older, it's difficult to use something like milestones a, a, as the big marker. Um, and, and that's because everyone develops milestones uh, eventually, uh, or most people do. Uh, and so it's no longer an easy thing to detect. Uh, here you can see, uh, you know, uh, by age four, uh, you know, even people that are quite delayed, you know, eventually develop these things. Uh, so 
uh, how do you, um, you know, index that vulnerability later on? Um, well, you might consider a different unit of analysis. So, you know, maybe, maybe the videotape um, observation method doesn't work anymore or looking at hospital records or, or parent report of delayed milestones. So you might try a new unit of analysis. And, and um, we have been finding that that's really useful. Um, so th this example isn't exactly like an earth shattering new unit of analysis. It's more of a, a, an experimental paradigm where children interact at a lunch table. We're still using motor coding here, but we're looking at um, a fine motor movement this time. So this is from uh, Jason Schiffman's work. Uh, he looked at um, the Sarnoff Mednik uh, Danish high risk data and uh, took videos at, at, um, took the videos that were were there of, of uh, children eating lunch. These are 11 to 13 year olds. Both of these children have a parent with schizophrenia. Um, uh, the child on the right, the young man, develops schizophrenia in, in adulthood, and the young woman on the left does not. And you can see here, uh, when you look at fine motor movement, now there's an obvious uh, deficit. And you wouldn't have been able to pick up on this in childhood because fine motor skills were still in ascendance. But here in, in adoles early adolescence, late childhood, it, it's quite obvious. You can see he's using his whole torso and his upper body to, to use the fork and the knife and the spoon. And so the idea here is that you can get at the same vulnerability with developmentally appropriate assessments or units of analysis. Um, so, for example, uh, we see clumsiness in children that go on to develop schizophrenia, um, but eventually adults are much less clumsy. And so um, how do you get at that uh, vulnerability? Uh, well, we use um, an instrumental assessment paradigm, which would fall under you know, the paradigm unit of analysis. And uh, specifically, it's a highly sensitive scale uh, that allows us to detect extremely minute sway. So the participant is required to just stand there in this, in this particular condition. And you can see her kind of, you can't see with your eyes that she's moving, but uh, when, when you're um, balancing, you're actually doing lots of tiny little corrections based on sensory input. And it's challenging your cerebellum. It's actually kind of a miracle being able to stand. Um, and and uh, in schizophrenia, we see wide sway areas here. Um, and so we're able to parameterize that. And, and uh, again, it wouldn't be possible to get a young child to stand on the scale, but uh, similarly, uh, you're flipping it, you, you could get an adult on it and you wouldn't be able to see clumsiness. So when we use um, paradigms like this, we're able to see high risk uh, individuals have a much wider sway area. And, uh, some of the follow-up work in my lab has linked this to uh, cerebellar circuit abnormality, structural and functional. Um, for the purposes of these slides, uh, UHR and CHR are acronym that mean clinical high risk or ultra high risk. So that's the, the program. Uh, so the, the first circuit that I want to briefly talk about, I'm going to give you an example or two of each circuit, uh, is the basal ganglia circuit. And, you know, this is central to the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia. It's believed to be highly implicated in positive symptoms like hallucinations and delusions. But the basal ganglia circuit also regulates motor behavior. Um, it is uh, really uh, quite incredible. At any given time, the basal ganglia is placing a uh, tonic level of inhibitory control on the thalamocortical neurons that um, allow for motor behavior to happen. And when there are increases in dopamine, that there's a net decrease in that control. And when there are decreases in dopamine, that control continues or increases again. And that allows for a gating of movement. And so um, this subtle system can become uh, quite dysregulated when there's abnormalities in dopamine. So for example, in Parkinson's, uh, there's too much inhibitory control. And so people are slow and rigid. In schizophrenia, uh, there's disinhibition. So unintended movements get, get through. And so you can look at something like ballistic movements, uh, jerking, withering, uh, anything with counter contraction, like, like the athetosis I showed you, and understand that something is going wrong with the basal ganglia dopamine system. And so I uh, was interested in seeing if the teenagers that met criteria for the clinical high-risk syndrome or the prodrome I uh, showed these kinds of ballistic movements and I used a uh, neurological uh, side effect scale to um, find items that were validated for looking specifically at these kinds of dyskinetic movements uh, and I trained raters and 
we looked for things like arm jerks, uh, head, head twitches, and that kind of thing. We ruled out neurological disorders, tick disorders, and that kind of thing. And what we found is really striking. So in this particular paradigm, we recruited 40 high-risk individuals and followed them for two years. 10 of them developed psychotic disorders. And then we went back to baseline and we looked at the motor behavior. And what we found was the people that converted showed significantly more dyskinesia in the face and upper body, roughly the odds three. If you, if you had these, uh, you were three times more likely to develop a psychotic disorder in a year or two. And, and uh, this has been very well replicated. And our follow-up work looking at each year has suggested that the magnitude of the correlation between severity and frequency of these dyskinetic movements and positive symptoms increases significantly each year. So it's, it's just a great, uh, it's a great way uh, at, at basal ganglia dopamine abnormality without needing a scanner or PET imaging. Um, and it's quite specific to psychosis. Cerebellar circuits are also of great interest. Um, what ganglia circuits are involved with, you know, selecting a particular action, the cerebellum is adding skill to that action. I like to use the example of uh, throwing a baseball. The basal, the basal ganglia is getting you the speed and, and uh, the basic thrust and the uh, cerebellar circuit is giving you the spin on the ball. Um, and in addition to, um, you know, uh, helping with balance, the cerebellum has gotten increased in tension. Uh, it's, it's been given the short shrift for a long time, it's, but it's gotten a lot of good attention lately uh, for, for doing a lot more than just balance and sensory integration. Um, work with Rick, Rick Ivory and uh, Ido suggests that it might be an all-purpose modulator that's involved in uh, taking incoming information and comparing it to internal models uh, and then updating those models uh, based on error detection and allowing for learning and efficient behavior. And so um, the cerebellum is, is quite relevant and uh, central to Nancy Andreessen's cognitive dysmetria model that suggests when the system goes awry, um, association matrix uh, matrices can become misaligned. Uh, there can be bottlenecks that cause slowing, and it might explain a whole range of heterogeneous uh, psychotic symptoms. So we're interested in um, interrogating uh, the cerebellum and my lab has spent a lot of uh, time looking at uh, re functionally relevant sub areas. Um, in this particular paradigm, we're interested in motor learning and we want to interrogate these feedback and feed forward and all purpose modulator mechanisms I spoke of. In the old days, we would have gone to Radio Shack and bought a record player and made this pursuit rotor paradigm, but now we can use um, uh, software, uh, which is great. In this task, you trace the red cursor, it moves around in a circle. We chitrate everyone until they start at the place where roughly they keep it on at about 80%. Um, and, and then we uh, repeat blocks of this uh, over a period of an hour and people get better at it. And um, we also did some cerebellar imaging and we found that the high risk group had smaller um, volumes in this uh, relevant green area, which is more of a motor area, the anterior cerebellum, and, and this red cruise one area, which is more of a cognitive area, the superior posterior cerebellum. Uh, and so what was so interesting here was that the high risk group didn't show um, the uh, le level of proficiency throughout the trial, or, and there was a, a significant difference in learning as well. And that difference was related to learning rate. Um, and the reason why I like to highlight this work is it highlights uh, the use of a treatment application. So, you know, we, we, we found a specific cerebellar abnormality. We did a follow-up study where we used brain stimulation, TDCS here, uh, with an attempt to raise the resting membrane potential and affect motor learning. And so we replicated, uh, you know, the earlier experiment in an analog high-risk group, uh, individuals showing non-clinical psychosis symptoms. And we found the same kind of thing, uh, you know, people with the vulnerability didn't show the same rate of learning. Um, this is a double blind. Uh, so people got sham or stimulation and they came back or got sham and stimulation for purposes of, of illustration. I've moved all the shams to the left here, um, but you can see after 20 minutes of cerebellar stimulation, the groups look very similar. Um, Currently, we're doing this work in schizophrenia with the NARSAD project, uh, yeah, looking at it in the scanner after, after the TDCS session. Um, the third circuit uh, is um, one I'm very excited about, and this is the 
Cortica Cortica Motor Circuit. Um, so gesture is worthy of its own workshop. Uh, it, it's tied to language and development and cognition in many important ways. We're interested in, it in schizophrenia because it might contribute to many of the social deficits that these individuals have that really contribute to disability. But we're also interested in it because many of the same areas that overlap with gesture perception and performance and interpretation are the cortical regions that we think are so interesting in schizophrenia. So when I gesture right now, for example, I'm making a round motion. That's considered a beat gesture. It's kind of like a comma. If I make like a dog while I'm talking about a dog, that's an icon, uh, a, quite a literal gesture. But if I'm talking about something like love and I make a cup, that's more of an abstract metaphoric gesture. These kinds of gestures uh, orient the, the listener at, and make them pay attention, but they also help me think and communicate. And it's experimental paradigm suggests when that's disrupted on either side, uh, communication goes way down. And what we find in psychosis is while people are moving, psychosis risk is while people are moving more uh, with non-purposeful movements, like fixing their collar or their hair, you know, they're, they're really not using these effective gestures. We also find that they're mismatching gestures more often. So they might be saying up and be pointing down or left and be pointing right. And uh, so there's clearly uh, so something going on there. We're also interested in the way that people perceive errors in gesture. Here's a paradigm that we're using right now in a, in a project with uh, Stu Shankman and Randy Auerbach, uh, where, where we're asking people to look at the actor with an eye tracking study. And, and uh, we're curious to see how they process uh, mismatched gestures. The actor's gonna be talking about one thing and uh, gesturing uh, about something else. And you'll see how disruptive this is. This past weekend was very special because my little nephew had a birthday. Because he was turning seven, we wanted to make it an incredible event. When my mother and I had originally asked him what he wanted. So you, you can see it's kind of off-putting, right? Or a little odd. You're detecting, you're detecting these errors. And, and what we're finding is that um, in our preliminary work, that high-risk individuals might not be detecting the errors in the same way and reacting to them in the same way. Um, so we're, 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 we're developing lots of types of tasks to get at these different units of analysis and circuits. Um, it, it, here we see that high risk patients are uh, not looking at abstract gestures at the same length as, as controls, but they look at uh, literal gestures, you know, statistically roughly the same. Um, so just briefly in the last minute or two, putting this all together, um, we know that people in the program might not develop psychosis. Uh, you know, only a third at, at, at most do. Some get better, some stay the same. And those that do develop it, develop it in different ways. Uh, quickly, not quickly, um, uh, predominantly positive symptoms, predominantly negative symptoms. And so there's a lot of uh, potential for subgrouping here. And so I've used these different motor behaviors and subgrouping studies. In this last study I'll show you, uh, the lab looked at, um, we didn't look at gesture here, but we did look at basal ganglia and cerebellar markers. And using k-means, we, we found uh, distinct subgroups that, that suggested that there were at least three uh, groups of high-risk people. Uh, one of them is more defined by these basal ganglia abnormalities, one more by cerebellar, and one by neither. And, and these individuals have different cognitive profiles. Um, they, they have different risk of conversion. Uh, and, and so it's, it's, it's uh, really promising for getting at precision medicine or targeted treatment. And so we have a lot of hope for this kind of work. So in closing, I, I just wanna say, you know, one of the goals of this is to keep moving earlier um, and, and learning how to intercede uh, earlier and earlier in the psychosis prodrome. And we are also interested in transdiagnostic perspectives. Applying this to depression is, is something the lab is doing in a, in a big project right now with Stu Shankman and Sebastian Walther. Uh, we're looking at keystroke variability and motor slowing to see if that predicts remission and uh, onset of, of depression. And we're trying to develop an app for uh, clinicians to use uh, so they can do better treatment tracking. Um, we are building motor markers into larger studies. The, we're looking at uh, the voice as a motor modulator. Uh, and in addition to that, um, that's, that's influenced by the Parkinson's literature. We're seeing if we can predict the onset of psychosis by looking at uh, dysthartria or a type of slowing. Um, in addition to that, um, we are, we've developed scales. Uh, we have a new scale that gets at some of these RDOC um, units of analysis that just came out in Schizophrenia Bulletin. 
Um, the, the lab is uh, also looking at things like finger tapping. Uh, we try to develop scales that people can use on the computer without going into a specialty clinic and things that really tap into mechanism. And so we have a great finger tapping task we've developed. And we're also really interested in, in scaling this out and looking at motor behavior much more broadly in the prodrome. One of the, one of the ways we're doing that is looking at motor behavior with instrumental approaches. Things like uh, handwriting, for example, you can highlight everyone that you'd be able to see with your eyes uh, with a traditional observer based method, but also um, highlight people that you would you would have missed the show club subclinical movements. And so it's a really exciting um, development. So I want to thank my uh, various collaborators and turn the panel over to um, Adam Kajawa. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I am happy to be a part of this panel, and I'm going to be talking about my work on initial response to reward and the development of depressive symptoms. So if we think about the RDOC matrix, the work I'm going to focus on today is on the positive valence systems domain. And thinking about units of analysis, I tend to be sort of towards this side of the matrix, uh, focusing on physiology, behavior, and self-report. Positive valence systems are further subdivided into the constructs of reward responsiveness, which I'll focus on today, in particular, that initial response to reward. There are also the reward learning and reward valuation constructs. So an outline for my talk today, I'm gonna to talk briefly about a conceptual model linking initial response to reward and depression. Then thinking about how we measure reward responsiveness at the neurophysiological level and across development. And I'll show some data with low reward responsiveness as a prospective predictor of depressive symptoms across development, and then talk about um, the, what this means in terms of intervention and show some new data from my lab in terms of whether we can target reward responsiveness through interventions. So conceptually, we know that low reward responsiveness is often characteristic of depressive symptoms and of adults with depression. Uh, it's a, a aspect of depression that people tend to report that they experience less pleasure, less interest in seeking out previously rewarding experiences. And we also see this across units of analysis in terms of behavioral measures of low reward responsiveness and neural markers like reduced activation of the ventral striatum and other reward related brain regions. So in my work, I tend to look at depression, depression risk from a developmental perspective and thinking about what are some of the core emotional aspects of depression that may actually precede the development of the disorder where these things may emerge, alterations in emotional processing may actually emerge across childhood and adolescence and they might be vulnerability markers that we can use to identify youth at high risk and potentially to target through preventive interventions. And so from this perspective, reduced reward responsiveness might actually emerge earlier. We have some evidence that we see it in offspring of depressed mothers, or at least by age nine or so. So we might see this as an earlier emerging marker in childhood that predicts risk for depressive symptoms later on into adolescence and adulthood. But of course, we know that pathways to psychopathology are complex and they include a range of interacting risk factors. And so um, I'm interested in, so we know that it's not just reward responsiveness. One construct alone is probably not going to explain the complexity of psychopathology, but considering multiple variables like reward responsiveness and how it may interact with other risk factors like parental depression and stress, both of which we know are strong risk factors for the development of depression. So in my work, I do a lot of um, research with EEG methods or um, event-related potentials in particular derived from the EEG signal. And um, so that's a way to measure reward responsiveness at the neurophysiological level that has really high temporal resolution. So it allows us to measure what's happening in the brain just 100 or 200 milliseconds after something happens. Um, the nice thing about EEG and ERP measures also is that they're relatively economical. We can collect them from large samples. They are um, accessible and easily administered across development and from infants through uh, late life, uh, later late adulthood. <clears throat> 
So the work I'm going to talk about today uses this very simple guessing reward task to measure reward responsiveness. So um, the so participants are presented with two doors on the screen. They guess which door has a prize behind it, and they either see an upward green arrow that indicates that they won money or a downward red arrow indicating that they lost money. Um, and we record the EEG signal in response to this reward and loss feedback. Um, this task has been used extensively from in childhood through adolescence and adulthood. And it's just a really simple way to measure that neural response in response following reward feedback and loss feedback. And so when we look at ERP measures, we segment that continuous EEG data in response to discrete stimuli and average across trials. And what we end up with in this reward task is we see, so here across the x-axis, time is plotted and at zero milliseconds is when the person is told that they receive that feedback that they won money. And on the y-axis is the uh, is mean activity that um, in microvolts with negative values plotted up and positive values plotted down to support ERP conventions. So this is a neural response to gains that we see in children to feedback they won money. Um, and we can also look at how that averages across responses to loss. And we see overlap early on, but then around 250 to 350 milliseconds, the signals um, differentiate. And that is a component that we call the reward positivity. This is just showing the difference. That's a relative positivity to wins versus loss. We can also look at ERPs in terms of how they present across the scalp. And we see that this reward positivity is consistently maximal at the top of the head at frontocentral sites. And so we have a growing uh, body of literature to support this reward positivity as a valid and reliable neurophysiological measure of reward responsiveness that can be used across development. So we've shown that it's reliably assessed across development and it's also relatively stable across even six years of development from nine year olds uh, through, the, through age 15. It's also modestly correlated with observed and self-reported positive affect. Um, which supports the validity of the measure, but it is modestly. And so that's one thing that I will mention in my talk as well, that sometimes when we look at what we think is a similar construct across units of analysis, we find that they're not actually always that strongly correlated. And it's been correlated with activation of reward-related brain regions with fMRI research, so ventral, in particular ventral striatum and medial prefrontal cortex. And one thing that I'm really interested in is that the reward positivity is elicited both in response to social and monetary reward feedback. I won't have time today to talk too much about our work in that area, but we have some really promising results coming out of my lab showing that social, the social reward positivity can tell us even more about the development of depression and risk and treatment. So the first study I'm going to talk about today is looking at whether low reward responsiveness prospectively predicts the development of depressive symptoms, so how reward responsiveness and depression relate to each other across time, and also thinking about what information is gained by measuring reward responsiveness across units of analysis. So this is one way the RDAC matrix, matrix has inspired me to look at these processes across different types of measures and units and to really empirically evaluate what information is gained by integrating multiple methods. So these data are from the Stony Brook Temperament Study. This is a large longitudinal study directed by my graduate advisor, Dan Klein at Stony Brook University. Um, so at age three or age six, a large community sample of children were recruited. There's just over 600 children in the study overall. And we assessed um, parental depression using a semi-structured diagnostic interview with biological mothers and biological fathers when they were first admitted, uh, enrolled in the study, and then again at age nine when they returned for a follow-up assessment. At age nine, the children also completed that EEG reward task that I mentioned to you, and they completed a self-report measure of their depressive symptoms. And then at age 12, the uh, children now early adolescents were followed up again. They completed a measure, self-report measure of depressive symptoms again. And they also reported on their own perceptions of their the individual differences in reward responsiveness using a scale um, adapted from the BizFast scales. And so what I wanted to look at here is whether that neural measure of reward responsiveness, the reward positivity, and that self-reported measure of reward responsiveness the um, predicted depressive symptoms at age 12. And so this is controlling for symptoms at age nine in order to look at predictors of change in that time from late childhood into early adolescence. 
And what we found is that both the reward positivity and self-reported reward responsiveness were associated with depressive symptoms, both such that kids who, who were lower in reward responsiveness showed more of an increase in depressive symptoms. And these were unique effects. So there were modest effects for each of them, but they accounted for unique variants in outcomes. One thing that was interesting and a little bit surprising here is that the reward positivity and self-reported reward responsiveness were not related to each other in the sample. So they seem to be getting at distinct aspects of reward responsiveness, but they both seem to be telling us something about vulnerability for depression. I also looked at whether parental depression moderated these effects, and we did not find effects for depression in fathers, um, which we've seen across a number of studies. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about if there's questions about that, but we did find significant interactions with mother maternal depression, lifetime history of depression for both the neural and self-reported measure. So again, they're count accounting, these interactions are accounting for unique variants in outcomes. So on this side of the slide, I've plotted the ERPs at age nine as a function of children's depression when they were 12. And so what you can see here is if we look at the kids who were lower in depression at age 12, they show a more robust reward responsiveness, more differentiation in the response to wins compared to losses, more red across the scalp, which reflects more differentiation in the neural response to those two conditions. And then when we look at the kids who ended up having higher depression at age 12, they were more blunted. You can see less differentiation between those two conditions and less um, activation across the scalp. And then when we look at that moderation effect, the way that this um, the way that this presented is that maternal depression significantly predicted increases in depressive symptoms at age 12, as we would expect based on robust literature. Um, but this was moderated by reward responsiveness such that maternal depression was a significant predictor for kids who were at low, low in the reward positivity component and also for kids who showed an average reward positivity, average neural reward responsiveness, but it was not a significant predictor um, for uh, children who were high in neural reward responsiveness. So even this established predictor of maternal depression in this age range across these three years was not significant for those who showed more kind of robust reward response. And the same pattern emerged for self-reported reward responsiveness, that maternal depression was a significant predictor for those at mean and low levels of self-reported reward responsiveness, but not the high levels. So this really seems to suggest that there's this underlying vulnerability reflected by low reward responsiveness that predicts potential, uh, predicts increases in later depression and increasing risk across development. And we have also looked at how reward responsiveness interacts with other risk factors. We've seen that low social reward responsiveness as measured by this reward positivity component is associated, moderates the effects of interpersonal stress on depressive symptoms. This is in a cross-sectional sample of emerging adults. Um, we have also, and then my um, colleague Brandon Goldstein with the Stony Brook Temperament Study data also showed that low, a low reward positivity um, interacted with stressful life events to predict um, depressive symptoms in that same time period from age nine to age 12. So again, really supporting the idea that this seems to be one kind of key process involved in the development of depression. And by understanding these emotional, uh, these dimensions of emotionality and looking at them across development, we can inform, that can improve our ability to predict outcomes and identify children at risk. And so for, for the second part of my talk, so I'm really interested in whether, what we do with this information, how do we translate this to intervention? And in particular, is reward responsiveness a feasible intervention target? We're thinking about more precise approaches to um, treatment and prevention. Can we target reward responsiveness? And if so, how, and how do we target it? Do our treatments, our existing treatments change reward responsiveness or do we need to tailor our treatments in some way? And so my lab has recently finished conducting an adolescent depression treatment study um, where we enrolled 70 adolescents between 14 and 18 years old. Um, this pie chart shows the breakdown of their diagnoses. They were all currently depressed and most of them had chronic depression um, and, and pretty significant, at least moderate to severe uh, current depression. And so, uh, so they completed an EEG assessment before and after cognitive behavioral therapy, um, which was 16 sessions of group um, coping with depression, the adolescent coping with depression course. So a pretty intensive dose of CBT. Um, so we had 50, we had 66 complete the initial EEG, 56 
um, were in treatment. We only had about had 37 that completed treatment. Um, and then we added a second EEG a little bit later on. We lost some data due to COVID, but we had um, 24 who completed treatment. They completed the 16 sessions or approximately or close to it, and then completed the post-treatment EEG. This just shows the number of sessions completed. And you can see that most of them had the, the largest, um, the most common number of sessions were like 13 or 14. So they got a good dose of treatment. And these were long um, CBT sessions too, of, of about an hour and a half. And so we wanted to see, does the reward positivity increase following CBT? And we found that it does not seem to. So this is a small sample, but we're not seeing any sign of an increase. If anything, we're actually seeing a pattern where the reward positivity seems to be a little bit reduced after treatment, which we think may be due to the repeated administrations of the task in a relatively short amount of time and maybe some lack of engagement there. Um, and this is consistent also with my colleague, Katie Burkhaus has a, has a paper where she looked at the reward positivity before and after CBT and antidepressant treatment in adults and also found that there doesn't seem to be this overall increase. So CBT, traditional CBT is not really enhancing reward responsiveness. But what we did find here is that relative increases in the reward positivity are associated with reductions in symptoms of depression and more specifically symptoms of anhedonia. So this is looking at um, change from pre minus post treatment reward positivity and anhedonia. So the um, teens who are up here on anhedonia showed more of a reduction. Um, the ones who are down here in reward positivity showed more of a, in, a relative increase in the reward positivity at time two. And you can see that those who showed a relative increase showed more, also that related to more of a reduction in symptoms. So it's a, it's a small sample and so there's some limitations here, of course, but this tells us that something about moving around reward responsiveness does seem to be have um, clinical utility and to be clinically meaningful. And so lastly, my lab, we've been really interested in how um, we can refine interventions to more directly target the reward positivity and reward responsiveness. And so we um, conducted a proof of concept or analog study to see if we are able to kind of move this around in a lab session through a brief motivational manipulation. And we found that we are actually with, uh, with instructions manipulations more directly targeting reward responsiveness in the session, we're able to kind of modulate reward positivity. So it does seem to be something that could be an intervention target. So what we did here is we had um, 98 emerging adults complete an ERP monetary incentive delay task and they completed it two times. The first time they just, everyone got standard instructions on how the task works. The second time they were randomized to the neutral standard instruction again, but a little bit longer, or a brief motivational manipulation. And so for that manipulation, we prompted participants to think about what it is that they wanna do with their earnings and kind of think about a personally salient reward and why they want to earn that. And to think about, um, think about how much they want to win those rewards. And so we found that there were no differences between the groups and reward responsiveness in round one, but there were significant effects of this motivational manipulation in round two across um, units of analysis when looking at reward responsiveness. So at, in round two, participants in the motivational manipulation reported increased motivation to win. They also, also showed faster reaction time on targets in order to obtain a reward, and they showed an enhanced reward positivity ERP component. And so you can see that here, the motivation group. So this is looking at win versus loss with more positive values reflecting greater differentiation or with um, the red values here reflecting um, more differentiation. So we see more of a reward response in that motivational group compared to the neutral group with the second administration. And looking at the ERPs here with this solid green line, you can see more of a, that's the motivation group when they win money in that second round. And you can see more of a positivity in the motivation group compared to the neutral group. So pulling this all together, um, this, these data suggest that low reward responsiveness seems to be an underlying vulnerability for depressive symptoms. And so studying it across time can help to inform how symptoms emerge across development. And it seems to prospectively predict increases in depressive symptoms and moderate the effects of other risk factors on outcomes for children and adolescents. 
these data also suggest that we get unique information across units of analysis with um, the RDOC matrix. And so there's some challenges with looking at multiple levels of analysis because sometimes they don't always relate to each other in the ways that we think they should, or they're only modestly associated with each other. Um, but these data support the utility of integrating information from multiple measures, even if they're not telling us they're not getting at the exact same process, they're actually improving our ability to kind of predict outcomes and to account for more variance in outcomes. And so the reward positivity does not seem to increase following our standard cognitive behavioral therapy for depression though. So that suggests to me, um, but relative increases are correlated with reductions in anhedonia. So it suggests that there is some clinical utility to moving reward responsiveness, but we have to figure out a better way to directly target reward responsiveness. And I think that's a really important next step in terms of precision or personalized approaches to intervention. And so one way, it does seem that it's modifiable through um, manipulations that more directly target reward salience and motivation. And my lab um, is working now to figure out what does this mean for um, prevention and whether we can then use some of these pro approaches to um, increase reward responsiveness earlier in children at risk for depression. So I would like to thank my lab, the Mood, Emotion, and Development Lab at Vanderbilt, and also my graduate mentors, Dan Klein and Greg Hijack in the Stony Brook Temperament Study. And our next speaker is Dr. Anne-Marie McNamara at Texas A&M. Hello, Hi everyone, I'm Anne-Marie McNamara, I'm at Texas A&M, and I'm very happy to be part of this and I want to thank APS and the RDOC team for uh, inviting me to participate. So I'll be talking today about our work looking at the effect of neuroscience of anxiety. If I can get my slides to advance, just a second. There we go, okay. All right, um, so the measures that I'll be talking about in terms of the RDOX matrix um, fit under the negative valence system domain. And first I'll start by talking to you about some evidence that we have showing that anxiety disorders are associated with increased attention to negative stimuli. And then some work we found um, which shows something of the opposite, which is that some patients might be characterized actually by blunted responding to negative stimuli, that is reduced attention to negative stimuli. Then I'll move on to some of our more recent work, which was inspired by the RDOC initiative. And I'll present to you some evidence of an anxiety spectrum, as well as a candidate brain profile of comorbidity load that might signal increased uh, symptoms and worse prognosis in the anxiety disorders. So anxiety is costly on both a personal and societal level. It is prevalent and it is principally diagnosed by clinical interview. We have no neurobiological or objective tests to diagnose anxiety. Current treatments are only moderately effective, and treatment decisions are made based solely on provider and patient preference. We have more than one treatment, some work for some individuals, some work for different individuals, but we have no way of sorting out which treatment is best suited to which individual. If we had a better understanding of the pathophysiology of anxiety, we might be able to develop new treatments that work better and target this, these uh, aberrant pathophysiologies, but we also might be able to better match patients to the treatments that are best suited to them. One candidate mechanism underlying anxiety is excessive negative emotion generation. And I'm gonna define emotion here just so we're all on the same page. So when I say emotion, I'm referring to a multi-layered coordinated response to a stimulus that an individual appraises as having relevance to its goals. Or in another way of saying this, it would be an action tendency. And so what do I mean by that? Well, if we're walking down a dark alley at about two or 3 a.m., we might have certain emotional responses. We might feel afraid, we might feel our heart pounding, uh, we might have these action tendencies which prepare us to fight or to flee. So we are prepared uh, to engage in the actions that would benefit us in this situation. And our attention is drawn uh, to the potential threat of the situation. So evolutionarily, emotions have done as well. They have uh, saved us. But when our attention to negative stimuli or our emotional response is excessive, 
or when there is no uh, real threat, but we have those same kinds of emotional responses, that's when it is no longer uh, protective and it can actually become quite debilitating. And that's what's thought to be happening in anxiety, that basically these systems which have generally served us well are sort of hijacked and are over-functioning and uh, impairing us rather than aiding us. In the lab, we can study emotion using event-related potentials, or, ER or ERPs. And Autumn has already introduced you to these, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, but just briefly, in the context of studying emotion, we are typically showing participants emotional and neutral stimuli and comparing their brain responses to these different types of stimuli. So this event of interest uh, at zero milliseconds would be often the presentation of an emotional or a neutral picture. And following that event, we see a cascade of brain responses, which we can record in the ERP. ERPs have high temporal resolution, and for this reason, they are complementary to fMRI. And here's a schematic of the typical type of experimental setup that we might have. So we have a participant in the top left-hand corner there, and that person is viewing a negative picture. And then we have other pictures that we show them, some of which are negative and some of which are neutral. And we're recording their brain activity using EEG throughout this time. We're sending triggers to that EEG data so that later we can pull out the brain activity associated with one kind of stimulus versus another. We can average across trials and we can uh, produce ERPs. The ERP that I'll be focusing on today is called the Late Positive Potential, or the LPP. You can see it depicted here, and as in Autumn's graph, positive is down uh, just by ERP convention. So unpleasant pictures, which are denoted by the black line, are eliciting larger amplitudes when compared to neutral pictures, which are denoted by the dashed line. That positivity is maximal at central parietal sites, as you can see on the head. Um, so the LPP is larger for emotional compared to neutral stimuli. It's thought to measure the elaborated processing of stimulus salience. And it receives contributions from a wide variety of neural generators, including both limbic regions and prefrontal regions. When we have used the LPP to test this idea that anxiety should be associated with increased attention to negative stimuli, we have, in fact, confirmed that hypothesis. So the data uh, in, in A there on the left uh, is an unselected sample and on the bottom, on the x-axis, is state anxiety. And we see it as state anxiety increases. We have increased LPPs for negative stimuli. We also see this in GAD, generalized anxiety disorder, that's depicted on the right. So these are clinical individuals, and they also show larger LPPs to negative stimuli. Yet in contrast to this work, there is also the idea that some forms of affective psycho psychopathology might actually be characterized by something of the opposite, and that is emotional blunting. So this would be smaller responses to negative and positive stimuli compared to neutral stimuli. And the notion here is that maybe this is actually an evolutionarily conserved response to adversity. So when things get bad enough for long enough, it might be adaptive at some point to simply turn inwards and to stop attending to external stimuli, to stop trying essentially, stop seeking out or attending to these stimuli. Um, and this would serve to conserve valuable energy resources um, when efforts and attempts to change situation have been futile in the, in the recent past. And there is evidence of this emotional blunting, um, primarily so far in depression. This comes from the emotional context insensitivity work. And there is evidence that depression is associated with reduced attention to a variety of negative stimuli um, and positive stimuli using a number of methods. So we set out to determine whether that enhanced LPP that we saw in GAD um, might be different if these individuals had a comorbid diagnosis of depression. And uh, as pointed out uh, by Sarah Morris in the beginning, this is a very relevant question because a lot of individuals are comorbid when it comes to uh, all kinds of psychopathology, but particularly GAD is especially known to be comorbid. So a lot of these individuals in the, in the natural world, when not selected to be just with GAD, would have a diagnosis of comorbid depression. And so in this study, we had individuals with pure GAD who just had GAD, and they did show the heightened LPPs to negative stimuli. But then we also had individuals who had a comorbid diagnosis of depression, as well as a pure MDD group. And once we add depression in there, we no longer see that heightened response to negative stimuli. In fact, we see blunted response when compared to controls or those with GAD. 
So this suggests that the presence of a comorbidity like depression might change that pathophysiology. We might see something different going on in these individuals with more than one diagnosis. We see similar results uh, in youth. So this work was led by Autumn Kujawa. Um, and what we see here is a youth sample with anxiety disorders and then youth healthy controls. And we see that when we look at the LPP in these individuals, it is larger in the anxiety disordered group compared to controls. So this is in line with uh, the first results I showed you. It's the, the more basic idea that anxiety should be associated with increased attention to negative stimuli. So we do see that at the group level. But when we look across individuals in terms of their differences in depressive symptoms, we actually see something of the opposite. So these are the same individuals, same stimuli, and now we see that those who have more depressive symptoms show smaller LPPs to negative stimuli. So this suggests, again, that there might be more than one process here and that there might be sort of group differences in terms of heightened LPPs, but that levels of uh, comorbid depression, maybe increased severity, greater distress symptoms, might be characterized by blunted responding to negative stimuli. So, so far I've shown you some evidence that anxiety is associated with increased attention towards negative stimuli and that we can measure this using the LPP. And I've also shown you that there might be some individuals in there who actually show evidence of blunting. This might be linked to comorbidity. In this next study that I'm going to present, I'm going to show some of our work that has started to look across anxiety disorders with the ultimate aim of refining nosology. And in line with the RDOC initiative, uh, we have been trying to integrate multiple methodologies to achieve a more systemic understanding of negative emotion generation across anxiety. So comorbidity in the anxiety disorders is the norm. At least 50% of individuals at any given point in time will have another disorder. And comorbidity load is clinically meaningful associated with greater symptom severity, increased disability, higher risk of suicide, less chance that these folks will do well, that they will actually recover from their illness. And if they do, it's gonna take them longer and more resources to get there. So as a clinician, if a patient walks into my office and I know they have more than one diagnosis, this should signal something to me. This is prognostic. This should tell me that this person has more going on and importantly, that they're not as likely to do as well in the future. And yet, I don't know what to do with that information. I am likely to give them piecemeal treatment to treat one or maybe two of their diagnoses. I don't have a treatment for comorbidity. I don't have a special extra treatment that I give them. And that's largely because we don't understand the pathophysiology of comorbidity load. We know it's clinically meaningful, but we don't have any ways of tailoring treatment to these individuals. So perhaps if we had a better understanding of the pathophysiology of comorbidity, we would be able to provide better clinical care to these individuals. So the work that I'm about to show you uses ERPs, but it also uses fMRI BOLD, which measures changes in blood flow that are associated with neuronal activity. In complement to ERPs, it can achieve submillimeter resolution, so it has a very high spatial resolution. And in terms of BOLD, what would we expect when it comes to anxiety and depression? What would we expect to see? Well, in brief, when we're looking at uh, negative pictures, we would probably expect to see heightened activity in the salience network. The salience network is comprised of the amygdala, the insula, and the anterior cingulate cortex. And it is involved in detecting salient stimuli in the environment and sort of alerting the organism to those, to those stimuli um, and sorting out priorities in terms of attention and action. And so when viewing negative stimuli, we would expect increased activation in this network. So this data that I'm about to show you uh, was recruited in a way different to our prior studies. And what we did here is we focused on comorbidity load. So we wanted to achieve a range of severity across a sample of anxiety disordered patients. We required that all patients had a focal fear diagnosis, by which I mean specific phobia or performance only social anxiety. And we required that because we wanted to avoid the compound that might otherwise occur, whereby those who were more comorbid or more distressed might be absent of that focal fear uh, symptom. So we didn't want a situation where the low comorbid individuals had lots of focal fear and then the high comorbid, comorbid individuals were simply distress oriented and just didn't have that focal fear core. So we wanted to hold that constant across the sample and then allow comorbidity load to vary on top of that. So we had two groups. We had a low comorbid group who had a focal fear diagnosis and either zero or one other diagnosis. And then a high comorbid group who had, again, that focal fear core 
and then two or more other diagnoses. All participants performed a passive picture viewing task. They viewed negative and neutral pictures, and they had an fMRI recording and an EEG recording in separate sessions. And these are our results. So we found that individuals who are more comorbid had greater amygdala activation to negative versus neutral stimuli when compared to those that were less comorbid. We also saw smaller LPPs. So in these same individuals to the same stimuli, we saw that those who were more comorbid had smaller LPPs compared to those who were less comorbid. So together, this suggests a neurobiological pattern associated with comorbidity load that might be comprised of heightened alarm as signaled by greater salience network activation, along with reduced motivated elaborative processing as indicated by the blunted or reduced LPPs. We know that elaborative processing is probably necessary to bring about changes in the fear structure. So this is the, the basis of exposure therapy, right? We take individuals and we get them to sit with those anxiety inducing stimuli until they can receive information that contrasts that fear structure and can bring about changes in the level of threat or salience they ascribe to those stimuli. So by sitting with the stimuli and allowing that elaborative processing to occur, the change happens. So without that elaborative processing, as indicated by the LPP, we might have a cyclical uh, phenomena here where individuals who are more comorbid have that heightened alarm response, but they are unable to bring about changes in the salience of that stimuli because they never fully engage in that more elaborative prefrontally mediated processing. Therefore, uh, this profile, which we're referring to as harm A, might be a candidate unifying mechanism by which anxiety is maintained and worsens over time with individuals picking up additional diagnoses as they proceed. I'm going to show you some evidence um, that has supported this idea so far. So this is in the same sample. I'm just going to approach the question from a few different ways. And so what I'm going to show you here um, will, be, will be laid out along a, a, a amygdala insula connectivity dimension and a LPP dimension. So what we found was a, an interaction between amygdala insula connectivity, so that's the salience network, and the LPP. This was found in a continuous fashion across these patients, but I'm going to show you some data uh, broken up into groups here just because it's easier to visualize those brain responses when we split people up into quadrants. So the first quadrant I'm going to show you are individuals who had high levels of amygdala insula connectivity as well as small LPPs. So these are the harm A folks. Those are these individuals with this heightened alarm and reduced motivated attention. And you can see that heightened alarm in the insula connectivity in that brain. And you can see that smaller LPP at the bottom. These individuals had high scores on a latent depression measure. So they had high levels of latent depression. So these are our, our group that we would expect to have high levels of symptoms, and they do. Every other quadrant, so the other three quadrants, did not show this high level of depressive symptomatology. And so I'm making them big here just so you can see what's going on, and then I'll send them to their respective quadrants. So these individuals had low levels of amygdala insula connectivity and low or small LPPs, and you can see that in the brain and in the LPP waveforms. And you can also see their depression scores. They did not have elevated depression scores. This next quadrant, these are individuals with low levels of amygdala insula connectivity, but high or large LPPs, and they also did not show high levels of latent depression. And finally, individuals in that final quadrant who have both high levels of amygdala insula connectivity as well as large LPPs, they also do not show those high levels of latent depression. So it's really these folks in the top right-hand quadrant, those with the harm A profile that show the high levels of latent depression. We were also interested in knowing whether harm A might be related to historical comorbidity load. So we have this working hypothesis that maybe harm A sort of cycles upward with pathology. So there might be this sort of scar phenomenon by which bouts of psychopathology, prior historical diagnoses, might increase harm A, which might in turn increase further lability for psychopathology, so that these individuals sort of spiral upwards in terms of accruing additional diagnoses, becoming more comorbid, more severe, uh, more debilitated over time. And so we, we used harm A to predict, using a logistic regression, whether individuals were more likely to fall into a low or a high 
historical comorbidity load group, so based on the number of prior diagnoses. And what we found was in line with the notion that HARM-A is, is uh, increased by historical comorbidity load. So individuals with high levels of amygdala activity, as indicated by uh, right, rightward side of that amygdala graph on the x-axis, and low LPPs, that's the red line, or small LPPs, these are the HARM-A individuals. And you can see that they have a higher probability of having had a high historical comorbidity load. So these are the individuals with more historical diagnoses. And I should say that this is controlling for the number of current diagnoses. Finally, we did have the opportunity, uh, thanks to COVID actually, to recently uh, connect again with these individuals 12 to 18 months after their initial brain scans and to see how they were doing. And so we have time two data on these individuals and we were able to see whether this HARM-A brain profile predicted worse symptomatology at time two, controlling for time one. And this is specific to dysphoria here, what I'm showing you. And what we see again is that higher HARM-A at baseline at time one is predictive of greater dysphoric levels at time two. So it's the same pattern here. We have that low or small LPP with the red line, and then we have the high levels of amygdala activity on the x-axis at the right of each of those graphs. So it's present for both left and right amygdala. So again, these individuals with high HARM-A are the ones who have higher time two dysphoria controlling for time one dysphoria. So all in all, we have this, this brain profile, um, which we think is predicting future symptomatology, which relates to current symptomatology, and which appears to be also related to historical symptomatology, suggesting that it might uh, track comorbidity and the worst prognosis associated with comorbidity load across the anxiety spectrum. So in sum, I've shown you that anxiety is characterized by increased attention to negative stimuli. I've shown you at the same time that there is some evidence of blunting. And in trying to explore how those uh, two mechanisms might fit together, I've shown you evidence of an anxiety spectrum and an EEG fMRI brain profile that might mark comorbidity load and indicate worse prognosis across the anxiety disorders. In terms of future directions, I think that it will be important to sort out whether blunting is related specifically to depression or whether it might be something a bit broader than that related perhaps to distress in general or diffuse anxiety. I also think we need to revisit the RDOC negative valence systems um, and take a look at whether we might want to uh, sort of try to split that up a little bit more or think about the different multiple processes or stages that might be involved in negative valence systems. We have here in the work I've shown you two measures of negative valence system activity, um, but they're at the same level. So they're both brain measures, the LPP and, and the fMRI bold, um, and yet they're telling us different things. And so I think it's going to be important at some point to sort out uh, whether even at the same level of analysis, we might have different processes that can be measured by different measures. I want to thank my lab, the Multimethod Affect and Cognition Lab, my grad students, mentors and collaborators, and NIH for funding this work. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, I am forgetting to introduce Dr. Uma Vadyanathan, who is going to uh, sum some of this up for us. Uma is from uh, NIH. All right, thank you, Anne-Marie. Thank you for the wonderful talk as well. Hello, everyone. Um, I am gonna go through my slides quickly since I know we are running short in time and I would like to be mindful of your time. So we may not have time for a full-fledged Q&A session today, but what we'll do is have all our various presenters try to respond to your questions um, offline via email or some such. Uh, we'll check with Andy about that. But anyway, it's lovely to be here with you today and I'll try to sum this all up in a nice way. What I'm going to do in the next few minutes is go very briefly over our talks, highlight common um, RDoC relevant themes amongst them, and then focus on sort of questions or challenges that our various uh, panelists highlighted. Um, so here we go. Again, great set of talks. Vijay started off today um, by discussing the role of motor abnormalities in predicting conversion of clinical high risk individuals to psychosis. Autumn then picked up on that developmental theme, but she moved the spotlight to using reward responsivity in predicting depression. And then Anne-Marie focused on using MRI and EEG to parse depression and anxiety and see what they had in common versus unique aspects. 
There were numerous themes amongst these, amongst these studies that exemplified um, the principles we at RDoc advocate. And I've listed a few on these slides here. And to be clear, you know, these principles, a lot of these were around before RDoc was formally launched and they've been advocated by others in the field as well. So the goal of RDoc is not to claim that we were the first to do it, but rather as Sarah said, to put it all together in a package and as an initiative, as a set of research strategies that researchers can use in a convenient way when designing their studies especially because researchers had to use some of these um, things in really convoluted ways pre-RDoc. So the first and most obvious theme you saw among studies was the focus on constructs rather than just um, categorical diagnoses in all of them. So Vijay's study looked at clinical high-risk individuals, automatic work processing, and Anne Maria on depression, anxiety, and their intersection. So while our researchers used some sort of diagnosis as starting points, they did not focus solely on these labels. The second theme is again the dimensional aspect. So our researchers used a lot of dimensional measures to study these, which is advantageous, both from a clinical perspective, understanding how these phenomena manifest in the real world. I mean, people aren't just anxious or not anxious, they have a spectrum, right? And the other aspect is statistically, it gives you more power for your study when you do that. So that was the second major theme. The third major theme that you saw is the use of multiple methods, such as EEG, MRI, and self-report. Now, this is a particularly important theme for us because as Sarah mentioned to date, most mental health diagnoses and phenomena are, stu are studied using self-report or other report of feelings and behaviors. And while this is a useful start going beyond this to fully understand the connections between brain, body, environment, and development is important. And that's why we at RDoc focus particularly on mechanisms. And finally, one of the critiques we heard every now and then at RDoc is that it ignores the, the developmental component to mental disorders. And as you can see, Vijay alluded to this, but then we have tried to expand upon this and our panelists have clearly focused on studies that um, have a strong developmental angle to them. So we would like to say this is really not the case and that our docs in fact very amenable to developmental studies. Um, at this point, I think given our time limits, what I will do is skip over the rest of my slides and hand it off to Andy to wrap up. Andy, did you want to take over here since we're at five o'clock already? Absolutely. That sounds good. And we do want to be respectful of everyone's time. What we'll do is we'll, we'll brainstorm a way to, um, to address everyone's questions and, and uh, have them responded to by our participants today in a, in a great way. Look forward to a follow-up email if you registered for this webinar to learn more about how we can arrange for that. Um, but bottom line, um, we're, we're so thankful to our presenters from the university community and from National Institute of Mental Health for participating today. I'd also like to thank um, colleagues from NIMH, Jenny Pacheco, Syed Rizvi, and our doc unit head, Bruce Cuthbert, who's on the line today. And from the APS office, my colleague, Kekoa Erber, Michelle Johnfin, and Nick Antuch for their help today. And thank you very much to our audience. We, we really appreciate your participation. Again, um, we'll be making portions of this, uh, of this uh, recording available online following this webinar. And we'll be in touch with you about ways that um, we can continue uh, a discussion based off of uh, the wonderful content of the scientific talks we heard today. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate it so much. And we will see you again soon. Have a wonderful day. Bye.